Welcome back to our last message in our eight-week series on tough and tender, uh, working through uh, Second Peter and then now Jude. We kind of started Jude, that little letter towards the very end of the New Testament last week. We'll wrap that up today with our series. Uh, before we jump into our message today uh, with the emphasis on God's tender love, let's begin with prayer. Sanctify us by the truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, it's been a number of weeks that we've had this series, Tough and Tender. I pray that you've been encouraged by the Lord's word, which is tough, but obviously tender, which is the reason why it was written. Uh, and uh, last week, if you remember, among the many good things that Pastor Tim uh, mentioned, I want to emphasize uh, one thing, which uh, is our focus for today. Uh, in fact, if you're taking notes, go ahead and write this in there. Pastor Tim said he was tough. And that was his message last week. And it was a pretty tough message, and that was because of Jude. Most of the verses are really tough. And then he said, but we've set it up for this week for Pastor Bill, who's tender. So, appreciated that. <laughs> okay, Pastor Tim, he's tough and tender. I, I, I'm tender, I guess. I, I like to use humor. Uh, I, I think I'm accessible. Uh, but I also want to be known for being tough, being tough for God's purposes. And so I thought I would just kind of illustrate a little bit of how you can take tenderness and you can overdo it. You can be overly tender. In fact, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say as uh, you, you take stock of what's going on in our culture today, in our world today, at least the Western world, we tend to be overly tender our problem is not necessarily being too tough. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what is maybe the only virtue that we agree upon in our culture today? Maybe that virtue is tolerance. We just tolerate, it seems, everything as long as it's not tough. Isn't that kind of true? So, so again, just to illustrate why, why that can be a very dangerous thing. In fact, it is as dangerous as being overly tough. I wanted to share with you a story uh, that I often go to when it comes to temptation. Uh, Jude had really encouraged up to this point God's people to keep fighting against temptation, especially the temptation to use God's grace and abuse it as if it's a license to sin. And so this temptation... Uh, story and illustration. It's about a frog and a scorpion. I used this uh, years ago for the season of Lent for Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, how he withstood temptation. Let's see if you remember it. But I'm going to change it, actually. I'm going to make it overly, overly tender. I think you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> so there you go, the frog and the scorpion. They're on the uh, river banks, and the scorpion needs to get across to the other side. You remember the story? So the scorpion asks the frog, he says, hey, you can swim, I can't. Do you think you could give me a lift to the other side of the river? I'd really appreciate it. And the frog looks at the scorpion, he's like, are you kidding me? You'll sting me. And if you sting me, I'll die. Why would I give you a ride across the river? The scorpion's like, no, I get it, I get it. But just this once, and, and think of it. If I'm riding on your back and I sting you and you drown, then I'm going to drown with you. Why would I do that? The frog thought about it, he said, all right, just this once. So the scorpion jumps on the frog's back, and they swim across the river, and about halfway through, the scorpion stings the frog. And the frog just looks up confused as he's sinking down. He says, why in the world would you do that? Now we're both going to drown. And the scorpion just looks at him. He's like, well, I'm a scorpion. That's just what scorpions do. And that is a really sad story. <laughs> they both go down, and that's it. Temptation's bad, right? I don't like that story. It's too tough. It's too tough. So I've changed it. Let's say the scorpion gets on the frog's back and they swim across and everything's great. And the frog goes his way and the scorpion goes his way and it's a great day. Doesn't that sound a lot better than the story I just told you? Uh, this is the thought I'm wrestling with and with you. Maybe scorpions don't always sting. You might say it a different way. You know, they say that if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Well, maybe not. 
Maybe sometimes, somehow, some way, I can play with fire and not get burned. I kind of like that. And I think today, we just kind of like hearing that. You don't have to be tough. Let's just be tender. It's just love. Tolerate. Maybe scorpions don't sting. Maybe fires don't burn. Well, what if we applied that to our church practice? As we gather, and we gather to hear God's tenderness, his grace. Well, what if we just got rid of his toughness, the law, his will? We're just all about love. Uh, maybe filling in the blanks here. Again, a lot of blanks to fill in. But we always have to be so tough. Maybe tough on membership. I don't really think our membership requirements are all that tough, but but there are those that maybe feel like it is our requirements. Did you know that we, we, do, we have requirements to be members here, part of 92 Church? And membership is important. It is to be a blessing. It's how we recognize whom we can really serve and walk with throughout this life for our overall encouragement to partner together to further the gospel ministry. And so we have a thing called membership. And if you're new to Christianity, new to the faith, uh, we ask that you would meet with us, and I know it's a commitment, but for at least 10 lessons or discussions, an overview of the Bible, Jesus' teachings, because, well, that's what we're about, his tough and tender teachings, God's word. In fact, years ago, maybe some of you remember, it was actually a 20-week class. It was maybe half a year. We feel confident we can summarize things in about 10 weeks, but bef- much uh, earlier or shorter than that, it, it's really tough to cover the Bible. It's a big book. So, so what if we just kind of relented? What if we just said, you know what, just join? Of course, we want everyone to join, and, and we want to be committed to Christ's teaching because there's life, but in our day and age... That could be a little intense. What if somebody has a problem with one of the things from the scriptures? Well, let's just step over that. We just can avoid that. Let's just have anyone join. Then we could be overly tender. Doesn't it sound good? I mean, just think about the numbers that we could have, the community that we could be a part of. You in favor with that? Well, let's just see how it plays out. How about the next one? I mean, do we have to be so tough on the Lord's Supper? So we're going to be celebrating that in just a few moments as part of our service. And we, we have this practice we call close communion. It's where, though we want everyone to attend the Lord's Supper because it's amazing. It's a gift from Christ himself. We recognize from the scripture that God wants us to be instructed first. He wants us to be able to examine our hearts and see our need for grace That means to confess our sins. And then Jesus asks, and through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Apostle Paul, he wants us to recognize that in this, well, communion, there are elements, not just bread and wine, but his very, his very body and blood. Not symbolic, but really present. Yes, Christ, 2,000 years ago, his body, blood, crucified there for everyone to receive for forgiveness. And it's true, without Christ's body and blood, there is no forgiveness. He wants you to receive that in tangible form to recognize that. And and Paul says this in Corinthians, he says, look, if you don't recognize the body and blood, that you're receiving that, you can sin against that, and that just brings judgment. So one ought to be instructed. And not only that, when you come forward, Paul also says that you're one, There's unity that's being expressed on the teachings of Christ. So to be united means to know his word and to be united in his teaching and practice. But we could just out, you know, do away with that. We we could just say, hey, we don't have to have this practice of close communion. Just anybody can come. Now that seems overly tender, doesn't it? Kind of loving, but is that what's best for us? How many of you would be in favor of that? Or how about this? Um, On creeds in general, as opposed to deeds, there's this kind of mantra that's popular. It's been around for a while, but deeds, not creeds. Let's just be about loving others. Doctrines often divide. 
You start talking about the scriptures with people and you get uneasy. What if we were just about social causes and really loving others and being of good and not so big on the Bible? That sounds the way to go today. It sounds loving, but is that what we should be? Is that dangerous? Is that playing with a scorpion? That'll sting. Well, how about this? Another teaching of God on gender and human sexuality. I notice I've been up um, four times since May in preaching. I think every sermon I preached on some aspect of gender and human sexuality. You're probably getting tired of it. I am too. <laughs> but it's such a pressing issue, isn't it, today? I don't know if we can speak to it enough. In fact, I probably remind you because I've got a stack of books on my desk right now. How to teach gender and human sexuality to kids. I mean, just think of that. I think it's sad that in our day and age, kids just can't be kids for a little while. But they have to be adults sooner than they're ready. But that's the world in which we live. So I I, I could take the route. I could just say, look, yes, the Bible is very clear in in Genesis, God's design, male and female, and for the purposes of marriage and the benefit of society and human sexuality and how that's a gift for marriage. We, We could stand on that, which Jesus himself says in Matthew 19, but it would be so much easier today just to say maybe those parts of the scripture don't apply and maybe your gender perception is, is whatever you want it to be and you have those feelings and I don't deny that and, and you can live out however you'd like and I'm just going to say hey, be at peace. Oh, that would be so much easier, wouldn't it? But would we agree that's it's being far too tender And are you really being tender at all? I mean, is that even love? Something to wrestle with. How about on Scripture? I mean, should we take the approach that's common today that, yeah, this is God's word as much as you want it to be. But maybe this doesn't apply nor that or whatever because it's too tough. Or just think about this, other religions. I, I know we have a general audience that could be viewing online. For me to make the bold claim that Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father, he alone can provide the forgiveness of sins, that offends people. It offended the people in our gospel reading, the audience that Jesus was speaking to. It would be so much easier if we just kind of backed off. We were just a tender people. We didn't have to be tough. How many of you like those ideas well, good, because those aren't great ideas at all. And yet, th- that's the struggle in our culture today, isn't it? The world is so overly tender, but, well, I would suggest it's not truth and it's not love. And that's why, if we just sum up our thoughts, as we think about Jude, Jude knows God's people, God's word, in a sin-broken world where we are in a desperate situation in need of God's grace, we must be both tough and tender. And praise God, your pastors here, they're tough. And God, be praised and and God, empower us to be tender. We got to be both. And maybe I can just comment on that the nature of our culture today, which is overly, overly tender. And I don't know if it's for anyone's good. But this whole idea of tolerating anything and everything in the name of love, how does that really benefit others? Especially those that Jude would say need rescue and from the fire. I mean, think of this. Jesus was sent in this world, not because we're doing good and we're okay, But Jesus was sent in this world 2,000 years ago because there's a problem and we're going to die otherwise unless God intervenes. And and so his word is given. So so think of this. If you're ever in a situation and, and you see somebody being overly tender and they're not speaking up for the sake of someone else, for the truth that needs to be heard, what is really going on there? Isn't it a form of idolatry? Somebody is saying this, like, I know you need to hear the truth. I know you need to be rescued, but I'd rather have you like me than to speak a difficult conversation. I'll leave that to somebody else. And if somebody else comes along and says that, well, then I'll be quick to judge them because that's the only judgment you're allowed. 
is to condemn anyone who's tough. It is really trying to exalt yourself above God. God doesn't even take that approach. And, and think about the pride and arrogance of that too. It's, it's saying, I can outlove God. Oh, when God speaks this way here, that's too tough. I love a little bit more than Jesus, who died on the cross and suffered hell. And it, it is a form of cowardice too, isn't it, at the same time? No, I, I don't want to have that controversy. I don't want to have that tension. Again, I would rather be at peace with myself than have to be invested in someone else who needs to hear toughness and tenderness. Do you see why Jude, up to this point, has been so tough? And that's what Pastor Tim was hinting at in the first 19 verses of a 25-verse book. But praise God, he speaks the truth to us. Why? Because now we're ready for some tender words. And oh, are they so tender, especially the last verse for our consideration. So let's get to that now. Now that we've seen there is a danger in being overly tender, now that we've been tough again, let's, let's see this grace. Jude, recognizing the dire situation we're in, he gives us encouraging words like, we don't have to be a part of the generations that perish by being overly tender, abusing God's grace, like Moses' generation, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like the angels that fell, like the three individuals that were leaders and prominent figures in human history and that fell, fell uh, themselves too by abusing God's grace, Cain and Balaam and Korah. Jude says, you don't need to be like them here. Here's how you can be different. He says, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love, His truth, and grace. As you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Jude says, here's how you survive in a generation that is wicked and perishing. Fill in the blanks, there's about four of them. He says, build your faith. Build your faith on the word that is tough and tender. And that will cause us to pray more in the Spirit because it is tough. And in this, we'll keep ourselves in God's love. And this will keep us focused on waiting for the mercy that is coming when Christ comes again. Now, in parentheses, you see the three G's of our five in our mission statement, right? We're all about planning Jesus' roots to experience the life and love of God in the Holy Spirit's fruit. And the disciplines of the faith are exactly explained here by Jude. He says, build your faith. How do we do that? Well, it's by gathering in worship and listening to the word, which is tough, but for the tender purposes of God. And we don't just do that on a Sunday morning, though. We're committed as a community to standing firm, and we need each other to encourage each other to do the difficult work of standing both tough and tender. And so we group together with like-minded individuals in people's homes for small group Bible studies or in growth groups on Sunday morning. Again, we need each other. Otherwise, if we're not surrounded by fellow Christians, our mindset will be that of the world. And to our despair and destruction, we'll become overly tender. And we are in the Word of God at home. Which is why I love, too, that a part of this series, we had daily opportunities to read through First and Second Peter. Tough stuff. First, Second, Third John, and Jude, and tender words from God. I know my family and I, we were blessed at the end of the day to read through those scripture lessons. And it reminded me, like, yes, we're in spiritual warfare. It's tough out there, but praise God, he's with us. We're kept in the love of God. You can see the gather and group and grow roots there. And that's what Jude says, in order to not perish, to lovingly, tenderly stand firm in those roots. But he goes on. He's got another exhortation for us. He says about others, and he's got three audiences in mind. He says, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire of hell. 
And to others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So again, filling in the blanks, he wants us to be merciful to those who doubt. Who maybe in even hearing a message like this, say, wow, that is tough. To come alongside them and say, it's okay. God is love. You give grace. And then for those that have strayed or those who are lost, to have that mindset, wow, people need rescue. People need us to stand for the truth in love. To really have a view of this life is everyone that you see, they're either in a house that is on fire or have been rescued by Christ. How tough are we that we would be willing to enter into that burning house and to speak loving words to these souls that are trapped and lost in their sin. A lot like a child in a room where the house is burning and hides under the bed thinking that they'll be safe. To be bold to go into that room and say, you got to come with me. It's not safe to be where you're at. And I know I've been there. But there's hope. And to be persistent in that. See, that's what Jude is saying. Exercise your faith. This is the give and go route, isn't it? To not just get comfortable, to not just stay quiet, but to give sacrificially, to be willing to be like Jesus and persecuted for speaking the truths in love. It's to give and to go. That's our life mission. And to do so then with a sense of fear. So to save others from hell and to show mercy mixed with fear, realizing that when you go into someone's environment where they're entangled in sin and they're lost, don't get so comfortable that you might be entangled in that sin too. That's what he means by fearing and even loathing that clothing that's stained with corrupted flesh. Love the person, but be serious about that sin, even as we are sinners and need grace. These are tender words from Jude, although maybe you're thinking like I am, like, wow, that's still tough. When are we going to get to the tender parts? Because if you're, you're like me, maybe you see all that. It's like, I don't know if I can do all of this. I mean, am I going to be like those generations in the past that also perished? I don't have the strength. So now, finally, Jude is as tender as we need God to be. Jude says this, to him, that is Christ Jesus our Lord, our holy God, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Would you, if there isn't any note you've taken so far, that's fine, but take note of this, to him who is able. Friends, turn to the Lord God who is able. Um, yeah, gets me thinking about how unable I am. <laughs> In fact, I think it would probably be a fitting tattoo on my forehead just says, unable. <laughs> Maybe people wouldn't ask me uh, to help them, especially with home projects. I'm terrible. I'm unable when it comes to a home project. Anybody like that? Like it takes me three, four times longer than it should to get a simple project around the home done. Uh, I had to fix a toilet a, a few weeks ago. Just there was this seal that was broken between the tank and the toilet. Didn't even know that there was a seal there. So I'm like, wow, okay. So I YouTube it. It says 10-minute project. I'm like, I'm good to go. I take it all apart. It's not a 10-minute project. <laughs> not for me. Three and a half hours later, after several trips to Menards, finally watching the entire video, I put it back together. Probably three times as much as the cost that it should have been, but that's fine. And then I break to my wife, like, how manly am I? <laughs> Other projects, I kid you not, uh, I'm putting down sticker tiles, I call them, <laughs> on a floor in my previous house. So how hard is that? Probably a two-hour job, $300 cost. Well, took me six hours, and at the end, the last tile, I banged my elbow up against the side of an oven. And somehow I need seven stitches from that. And I go to urgent care, and two in the morning, like, what would you do? <laughs> I'm just like tile flooring. It was sticky tile flooring, so I don't know how I did that. And the bill for the hospital was more than the material for the floor. So that's... 
I put in a pull-up rig in my backyard. That sounds more impressive than it is. Like, it's what, two planks of wood <laughs> in a bar. I'm like, I ever use it. I don't ever use it. But anyway, after a broken windshield and almost breaking my wrist because too much torque on a drill, finally, yep, I have a pull-up rig I don't use. <laughs> I am not able, and I kid you not, I mean, and if that's just home projects, how true is that for spiritual needs? Praise God, he's able. He's able. He's able to rescue you and me. He already has in Christ. And I know you know that because you're here to hear that. And that's how Jude ends this tough letter. He says, God is able. God is able to rescue you as surely as he's able to make a beautiful day like today and a creation in six 24-hour days. And how many of you believe God did that? Raise your hand. Well, if he created all things, he knows how to rescue you and all your worries and struggles when you feel like I am not able. In fact, 2,000 years ago, he gave you Jesus. Before you even recognize the desperate situation we're in, he had already rescued you in Christ by his perfect life for you, by his death, which really did wash away all your sins, proven in an empty tomb, which is your future, an empty tomb. He's already given you his Holy Spirit in the waters of baptism and by his word as a deposit to guarantee your future is with God. You don't need to worry because God is able. So think of that. Whenever you're overwhelmed, whether by a home project, a relationship issue, or your relationship with God, he is able which is why he was so tough. It's so we could appreciate that grace and never abuse it or run from it. He's able. And that also explains why Jude ends this way with praise, as tough as he's been. He says, to him be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages. He is able and you are safe. There's no, nothing more tender to hear than that. Yes, to our Lord Jesus Christ, before all ages, now and forevermore, amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so tough and tender in your word. Now we appreciate your grace. And we see we are saved, for you are able. Continue to bless us with your grace and help us to never take it for granted. And then, Lord, empower us to speak in all boldness when we're called to, that we might truly rescue others. So, Lord, be with us. Build our faith. Keep us in prayer. Keep us in your love. 